My name is Tobias Ostrander, and I'm the Chief Curator and Deputy Director here at PAM. And I'm just thrilled to be here tonight with uh, one of my all-time favorite artists, Liliana Porter. Uh, her talk tonight is part of us celebrating her installation, um, which is in the English translation is The Man with the Axe and Other Brief Situations, which is in one of our project galleries right um, at the top of the stairs. And this was a, a large installation that we were able to acquire um, thanks to our uh, Jorge M. Perez Latin American Fund. And I want to thank Jorge, who's here. And, um, and it's, it's a piece that will be with us forever. And it's um, exciting to install it here. It came um, straight from the Venice Biennale, where it was shown for the second time and the first iteration of it was, um, was, was shown in Buenos Aires. And um, so we're happy to have um, a home for this installation. But um, I, I want to say, or I, ha I feel I need to say, that um, Liliana Porter is really a seminal figure in the history of, post -war, of the post-war period and has contributed you know, extensively to discussions around conceptual art practices in Latin America, in New York, and, and internationally. And um, her works very rigorously and often irreverently uh, investigate um, the structures of representation, and she'll talk more about that, and, and the diverse philosophical questions that images can produce. And, What's amazing about her work is the range. Um, there's a lot of humor in her work. There's a lot of um, irony in her work. Um, but behind it is a lot of philosophical thinking and, and thinking about how image, images function. And, uh, and she's been working at this for a long time. And um, her resume says she started creating art in 1959. And so, and, and it also mentions that she has shown in, in over 470 exhibitions in over 40 countries. Um, and she has lived in New York since 1964, um, but has maintained a very strong dialogue with Buenos Aires, where she was bo born. She was born in 1941. Um, what was interesting for me, she moved as a teenager to Mexico City, where I worked for many years, and Liliana and I did a retrospective or a large survey of her work at the Museo Tamayo in 2009, and that was an interesting revisiting of her early days in Mexico City. Um, but since the 60s, she's been a very important figure in, in, the, in the New York scene, but also through her printmaking in the New York Graphic Workshop, um, you know, circulating um, discussions around printmaking internationally in a very important way. Um, she works in painting and uh, installation and uh, film and more recently in theater. And I think she will talk about all of those mediums. I mean, she's collected widely. As I say, she was in the last Venice Biennale. She currently has an exhibition at El Museo del Barrio, a survey of her work called Other Situations that is up until March. So if you're in New York, please check that out. And she was in last year, she was also in the Radical Women exhibition um, from Pacific Standard Time and was um, you know, very featured in that exhibition. And um, a lot of people who didn't know her work were very drawn to it um, during, during that exhibition. Um, we have several pieces of, of Liliana's in the collection. Um, as does you know many extraordinary institutions throughout the world, including the Metropolitan in New York, the MoMA, um, the Smithsonian um, Museum of Fine Arts in Houston, and um, and her work continues to inspire um, uh, many generations of artists. Um, so um, I want to mention she will. Um, um, talk about some of her video work, and she's made five films up to the present day. Uh, and we will be doing a film series starting at the end of uh, February, one of her films each week for five weeks in, in this auditorium. So stay tuned for that. And I did want to mention that um, you know, she's very excited about her, her theater work. She's on her third play, or your fourth play? Fourth play, which she just um, the the play was called Them, which opened in October um, at the Kitchen in New York. And so, you know, her 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 dis her practice moves in many different directions, and um, and she'll be addressing that this evening. So please um, join me in welcoming Liliana Porter.
so thank you, thank you. I'm so happy to be here, and I thank the museum for the invitation. And Tobaya said everything I was going to say, so I don't know what to say now. <laughs> so like he said, um, I had worked during the years in different uh, mediums like drawing, printmaking, painting, installations, v uh, photography, then video. And five years ago, I, for the first time, presented a, th a theater piece, and I did uh, four of them. And I realized, uh, looking back and looking at the work through the years, that even if visually it had many times changed, the, the concept or the preoccupation or what generates them is, all, is always the same. And it is um, that I am interested in the concept of time and also in that limit that uh, between uh, the virtual space and the real space, in that ambiguous um, situation, no? So uh, the installation that is here, that I'm so happy that is here, um, in a way is a resume of everything I had done, and that includes a lot of works that I, uh, did and like dialogues and the traveler and in the men with the axe I was you know many times you do the works and then the explanations comes after no it's like the title also comes after so while you are doing it maybe you don't really know what you are doing but I came to the conclusion that the men with the axe is time no it's like he's uh, breaking everything, everything disappears, or um, you know, times erases a lot of things, but at the same time, a lot of things remain, remain in our memory and remain as objects. No? A lot of it's very interesting because I was thinking that uh, the objects are like. Co include simultaneous times. No, it's not one thing after the other. It's like memory. In our memory, we don't go from one year to the next and the next. Everything is together, and and it's a different kind of order. No. Let's put this first image if I. Okay. Well, this man is like four inches high. No. <laughs> doesn't look like, but um, also like there is something about scale that he's very small and when we see at the installation we are this huge uh, person looking down at all this disaster that he's doing, no? And so he's breaking a lot of things and and they are the similar sizes. They come from different history. Uh, some they have from different times. There are a lot that we recognize in our collective memory. Like here, there is Mao, and and the food of Mickey Mouse, and you know chairs and all kinds of things that um, are you know scattered in this mess, and at the same time, if we look carefully, we find some things that are a little more hopeful, like the gardener that is watering these flowers that are drawn in broken plates. No? And, and I think the thing is so big and, and the objects are so small that the viewer, in a way, creates its own narrative, because nobody sees it the same way, like you can start from a corner or not see something or you, uh, different people are interested in different things. I think that, that adds to me, is like the, the viewer is making a movie and, and is a, I think every person is a context. So everybody has a different relationship with the objects in a different way of, of seeing reality, you know? 
Here is another one. These are photographs from the installation here. And this man that is, seems to clean up that mess is also part of a series of works that I did that are called that I call them forced labor. And usually it's this small person trying to do a, a task that is much bigger than his possibilities or her possibilities. And I think it's a, a little bit a metaphor of ourselves in front of reality, trying to come with some explanation of what we are doing here, or what it's all about. Hmm? And for instance, these are these two guys are trying to disentangle this enormous uh, mountain of strings and cords and everything. And what I like is that they look, they are not worried. They look like it's possible. You know, they are doing it <laughs> at their own pace. And I think that's a little bit the way we are, you no? Know? Like we, you know, get up, have breakfast, instead of going crazy, like thinking, who are, what are we doing here? You know, we, we sort of organize things to, uh, I think to entertain ourselves, make all these rules, and then we have to, you know, wash the dishes and then go to the dentist. And you know, and all those things take a lot of time. So they are like distractions to, to the main question. And I, I really, sometimes when you start thinking of all those things, you say, it's amazing, you know, that, and I think it's wonderful that we all have that kind of hopeful attitude and, you know, we comb our hair, take a bath, you know, do, do all these positive things. And, and I think, I was thinking that, for instance, I feel that there is an explanation, that I don't know what the explanation is. But for me, uh, it's enough to know that there is, to have the faith that somehow all this, what is happening has some kind of explanation. And it's like, uh, I always think of this situation once I was in the subway and there was a Chinese man reading a Chinese newspaper and I said, it's amazing, you know, because I see and I cannot read and I don't know what it is and it's, like it's uh, forbidden for me to go into that reality. But I see that he can read. So I think that's the way I feel <clears throat> everything is, that I feel that there is some, somebody or there is a way of reading all this, there is an explanation, and we have to just have faith, you know, that that's the situation even if we will never know. And so here is another forced labor that she is trying to sweep all this blue uh, sand. No? So in this um, installation, there are a lot of these uh, workers, like here is the, the weaver that weaves this enormous blue <laughs> um, fabric. No? And they are like poetic metaphors of you know, that effort that we do to, to come to terms with the task that is in front of us. Um, so there are all the books. I, think, I love the books because uh, it's amazing that inside that object there is so, you know, so many things going on. And in the back you see a dialogue, a dialogue of this <laughs> dog with a bird, which is like a sort of impossible one, but I love that, you know, they relate. Uh, here, well, the clocks are a, a wonder, I mean, it's a little obvious, no, the metaphor, but I love this, the objects, the clocks. And then here you see uh, the, a little car that is the car of the Kennedys, and it's one that I found, uh, it's, a, um, it's a series of, it's a German toy that is a series of um, presidential cars and, what, and that people collect. And what is amazing is this is the only one who, that has people 
inside, no? And it's, I think it's, uh, what is amazing is that we know what happened, you know, 10 minutes after that second that we are seeing there. No? Well, again, more broken plates and all kinds of, there is the hand, the red hand of Mickey Mouse that appears very often. So now we change. This is a photograph. Let me see, we're gonna have this note. Ah, this is from two, 2011. It's a photograph that is called Them with Nazi. And one thing that I realize is also appears in the installation is the white background. In the white background that, or monochromatic background that is in all my photograph drawings, even theater plays, uh, have an explanation. And it's because I wanted to take the context away of the situation. So this doesn't happen on top of the table or in Miami or it's like, it's a non-space, a non-place, and therefore it's, it's a non-time. And I think that makes you go directly to the um, characters, no? And in this case, the characters are totally, they don't relate to each other, are different in sizes, have different in history, uh, you know, you see the Spanish dancer together with the communist, um, with the gun and the Nazi and Elvis Presley and Kennedy's son, and, you know, and they are all together. And I, I am interested in this possibility of making simultaneous things that are totally come from different moments and different memories and and to put them all together because I think there is something that unites that. And probably our, ourselves and the distance between ourselves and the thing, no? The other thing that to me is a subject that interests me is that what you saw before is an installation. They are objects that you could ch touch. Don't touch them, but they, you could. <laughs> But here is a representation, it's a photograph. It's a little farther away from us. That, the subject of representation for me is very, very uh, um, intriguing. It's something that I am interested. This is another, it's a, it's another photograph, very similar in concept to the other one. Again, with all these things. But at the same time, there are translations because he, there is Napoleon, but Napoleon now is a bottle of, I think, is uh, whiskey or I don't know, some kind of. Uh, so how also reality makes this metamorphosis like el, the Che is a mate, which is an Argentinian tea. Ah, well, this is older, but anyway, this is a dialogue. It's a photograph also. Could have been an object, but it's a photograph. And I love, I love that for this boy to connect with the duck, he has to just disregard that the duck is a drawing, no? So it's like also a little, you know, they, are, they come from two different uh, physicalities, let's say, but obviously they relate. And I, I love the idea that why, you know, the duck is in that lamp and, you know, all these translations and, and transmigrations of how things uh, travel, no? This is a painting and a photo. It's a, well, it's one work, no? It's called The Light. It's from 1996. And I like a lot uh, to work with uh, conventions. Like, for instance, the convention of a painting. This is, you know, a canvas. And before you do anything, it's like almost finished because the convention of the canvas, when you are on, in front of a canvas, you, you have this attitude that you think you are going to see art, which is already, you know, to have, it's like a lens to see reality, that to get in, you un, accept that virtual space of the canvas the way 
a viewer accepts when it's in the theater that the actors, you don't think it's an actor, it's a person. You just give in to the character he plays. No? And this is another dialogue that also I like uh, that one, is, one object is inside the photograph and the other is inside the canvas and that, let's see, that Christ suddenly is a lamp, no? And, but they don't seem to have any problem if it's a lamp or whatever. And they, it seems that Christ is giving very good advice to, <laughs> to Mickey Mouse. <laughs> now, this is, we are going back. This is from 1973. And I put it here because to show how from the beginning the idea is the same. It's the photograph of my hand with, that I drew a line uh, on my finger and on wherever I, I had my hand. And then the photograph is on the wall and I continue the line. So if I will, let's say, install this today in the museum, the line will be from you know, this year like, and, and it continues inside the photograph like 45 years ago, but we perceive it as one continuous line. No? And I like that possibility of putting together times that are dissimilar. You know, there is something uh, that, well, this is even a, a better example because it's a photograph that has the line. The, the lines in the photograph are photographed, are not drawn on top of the photograph, are photographed. Then the line continues in the mat, that the mat obviously came after. So let's say the mat was five years after. But then the drawing on the wall could have been yesterday. So all these dislocations of time but the, the triangle is like intact. No? Okay, now we change. This is an object that is, um, is more um, from probably five years ago or is more present. And so they are um, one situation. And this, is, uh, this comes from the um, uh, forced labor. And it's, it's called, I think, to fix it. And it's this small a person that is trying to fix this clock that is totally, you know, unfixable. But again, <laughs> he has his hopes. So this is also, we saw it in, in the installation, another weaver, but this is on a shelf, like a single piece, no? I did a series of these weavers and, they are very, they work very well. And also this is in a shelf that is round, it's very small, and again, uh, it's a version of the gardener. I like that, uh, that version. So, um, so I didn't bring drawings or anything, but I brought, <laughs> this is a three-dimensional, um, this photograph, now we change, is a still of a video. So I did five videos. And because it, I, I went from doing the objects to a photograph, and then the video is a totally different experience because you are adding first time, no? in movement, but also another super important element is music. Because music is the most, um, how do you call it, really manipulative element, because the music really changes what you are seeing. It really, um, you can put an object, and if you change totally the music while you are seeing the object, it looks like the object changes, because what really changes is your relationship with the thing. So this um, still comes from <clears throat> a video called uh, uh, The Fox in the Mirror. And it was 
uh, the idea was to make a concert, a concert from the point of view of people playing instrument, but also a concert in the sense of putting things happening at the same time. So they were like fragments of situations uh, using all this cast of um, objects, but there was nothing, no, no animation. If they move, it's because they have a cord or a hand moves them. They were as they are. And in general, uh, if something moves, was the camera or, or was because you know, they, they had a mechanism to, to move. This is another still actually from my first video uh, that was called For You. And she, uh, she was singing a tango, it was nice. <laughs> and this is from my last, uh, from my last video called uh, Breaking News. And in this moment, it was a long, it, it took a, like, it was this, uh, the same image for a long time, but the music was um, an, a spiritual, and it's interesting to see how uh, the, the music itself is very moving, that spiritual. And you keep looking at Elvis, which is a version of Elvis. I found this object in a flea market. And it's like, it's amazing that we still recognize him, no? And it was, it's moving when you, when you hear that music. By the way, Elvis liked very much spirituals. So suddenly, like, there was something happening, even if there was a silence, if he was still, and there was, the music was separated from, the sound was a different thing than, than the image, no? This is Lulu, she was also singing a song. I mean, we heard the song that she was singing, but she didn't move the leaves. <laughs> and then, it's very theatrical, the situation, no? But then I decided, um, I had the opportunity to make a theater play. And it was really the, the happiest, very happy experience because I, there is um, a book that is a dialogue with Ines Katzenstein, who is a curator from Argentina. And it, it's a dialogue between her and myself and at the end, she says, what would you like to do in the future? And I said, oh, I would like to do a theater play. So after that, I go to Argentina, and she says, she was directing at that time, she was in Buenos Aires directing um, a, 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 a art a program in, in a university. Now she's in MoMA, no? And she said, um, I have uh, the sponsor for your theater play. And I said, what theater play, no? And she said, you better spend the money. We have to spend the money before a year and three months. You know, the next day I was working on this. Thanks to Anna Tiscornia, she we both started to, see, to, to think. And and everything was so easy. I don't know how, you know, it's a long story, but anyway, to end, we ended up in a real theater in Buenos Aires with a cast of 12 people, dancers, and then the music was by Sylvia Meyer, who is a person I work with in all my videos. And there were six, um, six days that, we sh that it was presented. And I said to Anna, well, the first day, they come, you know, friends and everything, we feel the theater. But then the other five days, what do we do, no? <laughs> and I really was worried, and I, it's self-propaganda, but anyway, the second day, they were all sold out. And I really, I was levitating, no? <laughs> and, and it, were, it came out well, and every, you know, there's a lot of stories and things that happened, but it was really a super experience. And then there were two other possibilities uh, to present um, theater in Buenos Aires. One was um, a festival of performance, and another was in a museum. And the last one was last October in, in New York at the 
kitchen. Because they had an, I still have an exhibition at the Museo del Barrio in, in New York, and the invitation came together with uh, to present a theater play. Wow, I, I couldn't believe. And I brought the, the actors from Buenos Aires, which was another fantastic thing to use the same people. And some of them never were in New York before, so it was everything like super happy. And I love the kitchen uh, space. I, if you, some of you don't know what it is, it's a, a small theater in Chelsea of 150 seats. And it was the one where Laurie Anderson, all these performers started her, uh, their work and was the first place where they were, they show videos at the time that nobody wanted, you know, was a new thing. So it's like a historical place. And actually, the musician, um, Sylvia Meyer, she, um, she never wanted to play uh, alive in all the other uh, times where we made the theater. There had to be um, the sound only. And this time she said, hey, this time I'm going to play. In, in the piano of the kitchen, which is also this amazing piano. So it was a fantastic uh, experience. Ah, let me show you some photos. So this was, <laughs> this was a, a, because the structure, well, the play in the last play, what we did was to uh, see the other plays and, and choose the fragments that were, we thought we were better, and add something thinking that the context is New York. And this was a fragment that was, um, it's called a um, sculpture lesson advance, uh, um, because it was in Spanish, well, anyway, advanced level. So she comes <laughs> and brings this Mickey and starts to copy the Mickey and like if the audience were the students. And she does this, you know, terrible uh, thing, no? And but she's very proud, no? So she finishes <laughs> the thing, <laughs> and then she takes the 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 model away. She and she leaves uh, the thing there, and suddenly the light changes, and and the next, <laughs> um, I laugh at my own work. <laughs> Well, anyway, the next, the next scene is this guy who, who works for an auction house, you know, this prestigious house, <laughs> and he's auctioning the thing. And, and what is amazing, I have to say that the text of what he's saying was written by Anna Discornia, who writes very well. And he is trying to to explain what the thing is, no? <laughs> and the thing now is from, <laughs> from an unknown artist from the 70s. But everything he says is nothing is wrong. You know, it's like possible. So in, he uses all this philosophical and all this uh, vocabulary <laughs> of art. And so, you know, he's saying, um, you know, the influence of the French brutalism and, and all that, and the, the certainty in the errors and, you know, all like that. And then he, he auctioned it and he sell it for $500,000 to the, to the um, uh, Disney Corporation in San Francisco. So this is another scene. This was actually in the kitchen because the, the background is black. Um, and it's a scene where they speak in an invented language. It is amazing because after a little while you understand what they are saying. No? <laughs> and they talk about this object no? that no one knows what has inside. We will never know. But it's very important. No? And they fight, and they measure it, and they, you know, this thing uh, is the unknown thing that, in a way, unites them or or 
makes it gives a purpose probably of their to their life, and so I think well, it's it's a good metaphor too. Uh, and there, there is another, this is another fragment where uh, it's more a visual situation. I think it's more a poetic situation where I found this um, little sculpture in Chinatown that I think is beautiful. And she just comes and throws this blue sand. And, and it's really nice, the color and, and the situation, and there is nothing to say, no? I think it has to do maybe with beauty. So the last image I brought is, um, it was, um, this was in Buenos Aires actually, when um, it's almost the last scene where they bring all the objects they use in the performance because the objects are as important as the actors. No? Well, I think I don't have anything else. Ooh. So maybe. <laughs> Thank you. Um, if anybody has a comment or a question or something, it's nice. I don't know. <laughs> Your objects, are they all found objects or do you make any of them yourself? They are all, not only they are found objects, but I never intervene on them. They, you know, they are like that. One thing I will add, now that you asked that question, is that one thing, that incredible thing that happened when I started to do theater, is that I thought, well, now when human beings, is, you know, it's going to be more content, and it's the opposite, because the objects can, come complete. But the person, you have to tell the actor who they are, what they have to do, <laughs> what to dress, you know. The years, it's incredible. <laughs> you and the small one. The small ones are, uh, yeah, are, um, they are from a German company that I think are for people who collect electric trains. Yeah, and they put these people around. Yeah. Yes, Liliana, thank you for the poetry on your art. And my question is, how much influence poets and writers has indeed have in your art? Probably without me, I mean, not, in a way I could explain, but probably a lot because it's true that I was always interested in poetry and and I always think more in terms of for like a writer than a visual artist, that I think in terms of situations rather than colors or forms. So maybe it's, yeah, maybe it has to do with poetry. <laughs> I think so. My father was a writer in a theater um, in Argentina, and he had a great sense of humor. Maybe I copy from him. <laughs> Hi, Lilian. Um, you talk about the traveler in a couple of your pieces. Can you explain more of your influence on that and why? It's such an important figure. Yeah, in life. I think the traveler. Well, I think has because it is wonderful to put inside a lot of meaning because me, I think could mean the passage of time and could be our, you know, ourself of traveling through this, you know, life. And so, and also because I, I really like to make, I did a lot of drawings with travelers and installations and everything. And I, I like to put the little man or woman and then to draw the way. And then sometimes the way goes through a lot of things in the paintings and everything. Yeah, I think it's a metaphor of ourselves through life. 
Liliana, just can you talk about it in terms of um, uh, immigration or the traveler as a as a traveler across time as well, or you know, in the sense of displacement? Uh, a, a traveler, um, yeah, through different situations. You know, in my case, I lived in when I was born in Argentina. I lived in Mexico three years, in which you know, when you change countries, even if it's the, the same language, it changes a lot of codes. And then I, I was very aware uh, of the distance between things and words. I understood more Magritte <laughs> at the time. And and then coming here is a totally different language. And it's interesting how language changes the perception of things, no? So I think uh, the traveler also travels through all these realities, no? And these translations of reality, these different lenses to see reality, I think. I don't wanna ask a question, just say that you have such a great humor and intelligence in your pieces I saw that one, the Hombre con el Hacha, in the Venice, um, La Bienal de Venecia, two years ago, and I thought it had a lot of humor, but now that I'm listening to you, it's incredible, you know, how much intelligence there is, a, you know, behind oh. it, and I think you're great. Thank <laughs> you. I will come here more often, I think. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Oh. Thank you for your presentation. Um, I think you've added great depth to your images and you're very entertaining. I think everybody here in the room would agree. I, um, and I'm thankful that you've given great meaning and depth to the images. And I'm wondering how you feel as an artist for something that you've been doing for many, many years where your visual image has been co-opted by other artists and perhaps not with the same depth that you're bringing to your, to your images. Yeah. I, 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 I don't think I own, you know, anything. Everything is, I, I don't know. <laughs> no, I, I don't think so. I would be too presumptuous to really believe they are copying. No, maybe they are. <laughs> Um, you said um, when you started that across your mediums and genres that it basically came back to time. So I wondered, like, how, when did you realize that was your, that you went to that? Was it later on in your work or did you start that early on and you just continue the theme? It's, it's, it's interesting because, um, especially because, um, I was teaching a long time and I realized that one of the most difficult thing for a new uh, person who is doing art, starting to do art, is to understand what, who he, the person is, no? And I think that it happened when I came here, I think in 65, that we started the New York Graphic Workshop with two other artists, and we were really super uh, self, doing a lot of self-criticism and trying to understand what exactly we wanted to do. And so at the time my work was very expressionistic. I was mainly a printmaker. And I decided to really take away all the technical, you know, uh, to show off and try to do something with the minimal of elements. And then I started to work with a little string and, uh, and nails and things like that. And I realized that what I was really doing is working with the virtual space, the combination of the virtual space and the real space. Like for instance, there will be a print of a string and then the same string but in real coming out. And I thought that was like magic or to put a nail, a drawing of a nail on the wall and then put a string coming down to a real nail. And I think there, is because it's the same concept of mixing times. I think right there, I, I realized that was my subject, yeah. 
Hi, Liliana. Um, I was wondering if um, how you felt about the pictures generation of artists, and in particular, Lori Simmons and Sarah Charlesworth. I know that they also remove context in their work and in their imagery. And I was wondering um, if you had any feelings or opinions about your relationship with their work. I never thought of that, I have to confess. Um, and I don't <laughs> how terrible. But <laughs> yes. Uh, well, many people are in, because the subjects are archetypical subjects, really. It's not that I are my subjects. And so, um, for instance, um, let's say things I relate that I really relate, even if it had nothing to do, but that I, I will never forget, is, for instance, Liechtenstein and the brush stroke. So the brush stroke is um, formally totally different of what he's doing. A brush stroke is an expressionistic gesture, and the way he's painting it is the most um, mechanic, is the opposite. And so those things is, are the ones that are I am interested. I am interested also, for instance, in um, Morandi, in the paintings of Morandi, because uh, that simplicity is so extreme that it touches the opposite. No, it creates the negative space of the opposite of what he's doing. It's almost that you are about to understand. No. It's like Borges said that the aesthetic experience is the imminence of a revelation, not the revelation. And I think uh, that Morandi arrives to, to that imminence. I didn't answer your question. <laughs> <laughs> I just, um, I, I've, I've so much going through my head. First off, to say thank you, uh, just for, for giving us so much insight into your life and into your practice. And I, I think about how brave you were through this process. I mean, we're talking about you made making work since 1959, and you speak so just easily about how your practice changed mm -hmm. Uh, through through the medium from you know from yeah. painting and sculpture and drawing and and then I'm I'm going to I'm just I'm going to create theater and that's extraordinary because you're doing this I think at this point in time going across mediums is is more acceptable but certainly back when you started it wasn't so what was yeah. that like when you when you when you changed mediums for the first time and and I don't know, I just, I think it, it, it you're so brave. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> no, yes, well, I don't know. Um, I think um, probably you will be more aware if you are really thinking that there is an audience or somebody to give an explanation. But if you are working without thinking that you do whatever you want, and then it's wonderful when there is somebody who relates to what you are doing and then you can show and everything, no? But, uh, yeah, I think I'm lucky that way because it's like I am, in that sense, I have to say, a more free, no? Free, <laughs> I hope. Uh, uh, I have a question. Here I am. Where are you? Up here. Ah, yes. <laughs> I'm very intrigued to know, can you describe me your kitchen or your bedroom or something? I want to know if you really live in that tiny world and do you sometimes reduce to the scale, that scale and then you can talk with the people or simply you look it from outside and you see the complaint that you're trying to say or do you live with those tiny, those tiny uh, people? No, they, they, they all... <laughs> That's a great question. No, <laughs> I have a studio. In the studio, <laughs> there are some furniture with all this uh, cast. Many of them didn't work yet, and some work a lot. 
and but they are there. Then my kitchen is normal. Okay. <laughs> Thank you for that. Yeah, yeah. All the rest, you know, I like uh, simple, simple things. What do you call, call normal? <laughs> Um, no, without any persons, you know. Okay, <laughs> only you. Thank you very no, much. No, no, no objects or things like that. <laughs> <laughs> and actually, the work I had in the walls, not in the kitchen, but in the rest of the house, are mainly of other people, you know, friends or other artists. Um, so, like, normal, yeah. <laughs> it's like... Good. Nice. Thank you very much. <laughs> thank you, thank you. Hi, Liliana. Thank you so much. Uh, here. Uh, yeah. Okay. <laughs> I love your work. I love your sense of humor. Uh, but I, what I like the most is uh, the fact that, besides being poetry, your, your work of art, is the fact that you are a storyteller. And the fact that you're telling all, all these insights about your work, it's, you know, you got me trapped. I'm hypnotized <coughs> of what you're, you know, what were you thinking okay. behind, and I, I, I really appreciate that. Thanks. It's like, like you know, the writer reading his book, so it's beautiful. Oh, thanks. Thank you, Liliana. Well, hello. Yes. Um, so I'm a choreographer, and I'm I'm looking at your work through the lens of a choreographer. And what appeals to me is that you create static action somehow. And I know you were talking about this sense of passing time, but somehow you can get a sense that people are moving or objects are moving through space, even though they're not. So that was a, a comment. Um, and then a question is about your process. Do you, do you gather objects, put them in front of you, and arrange them until something happens. strikes you? Yeah. Well, for instance, in the series of dialogues, let's say I did a series of photographs that are dialogues. It's interesting because it would, be, it would have been interesting to make a video because let's say I like one object, I put it there. But then I come with others and I put it in front, doesn't work, doesn't work, you know, doesn't work. And then suddenly it works. Huh? And so it looks like they are predestined to, to, to con connect, no? But I don't, it's not that I know from the beginning, it's like it happens by itself, really. The only thing I create is the conditions so they are able to talk, let's say, no? Yeah. Hi, thank you. Um, can you talk a little bit more about time? Because you talk a lot about the passage of time but in a certain sense, you're also talking about um, an anti-linear time. Right. And a real question in a certain sense of modernity, and you're questioning that notion of time. So share with us your, your notions of time. Well, um, it's, it's more that I'm trying to understand you know, what, how time works, but I realize that almost doesn't exist, you know, like, let's say while we were, when I was showing the images, where is that moment, you know, everything is totally gone. We, and where is it? It has to be in the same place as Christopher Columbus or the main, you know, it's in a place where everything um, happens simultaneously. You know, that was what I tried to say before. And, and also in our memory, uh, also things are in a different order. But also in real life, we all have, a, we are a context and we have a lens that looks at things and create a different narrative. We all may see the same thing and we have a totally different relationship with the thing, which means that nothing is describable, nothing exists in one way. The only thing that exists is our relationship with the thing. So I think time is also that kind of, uh, is not, uh, because also 
let's say if we talk about more literal time, the clock, but in Argentina it's two years, two hours different, in Europe it's six hours, you know, what time is it? So uh, it, the moment you get closer, you want to get closer to a meaning, the thing uh, gets, uh, disappears, no? Uh, so that's why I don't know what to say, <laughs> because I myself wonder, no, what, what is time and, and what, uh, it, sometimes it's interesting because you are, when you start thinking, you go to the dictionary to see what it says, because the dictionary seems to be this presumptuous book that knows the meaning of things, no? And it doesn't, it doesn't work. Yeah. <laughs> Hi, I have a question that I'm reluctant to ask, but I'm gonna ask it. Um, last week we had a talk here about Latinx, and we were talking about Felix Gonzalez Torres, Torres. and whether he will identify as Latinx or not. Since we have you here, and he was not at the talk, in 15 years when people are writing about your work, um, would it be fair if they described you as a Latin American artist, as a Latinx artist, or as a universal artist? Universal doesn't exist, I think. But, um, well, I was born in Argentina. I, when you are a child, the first language really forms you forever, and the first things you see are, are the ones that are the point of reference for the rest of your life. So I, I feel like I'm Argentinian, therefore I am Latin American. And even if I live in New York since 1964, which is a long time ago, uh, I speak with an accent. Nobody's going to say I'm from New York. <laughs> and, so, I think they, they, all the experiences add to, you know, to who you are, but I think that what you learn when you are a child are what really defines you, unless you know, there is some kind of uh, need to erase something, and you know, it's a different traumatic thing or something. But uh, yeah, I feel like I'm Latin American. What happened, the other thing that happens is when I am in Argentina, when, before I started to travel, when I was in Argentina, I felt I am Argentinian, and the rest of the countries in Latin America are foreign countries. But when you come to New York, you start becoming Latin American, that you really identify with the other Latin American countries, and you feel that you belong not only to Argentina, but you, you feel really like the whole Latin America is your territory. Is it, it, that's a perception of people who leave their own country to live here, I think. I hope I answer. Mm -hmm. okay. Okay. Thank you. Hola. Hola. ¿Cómo estás? Bien. <laughs> I met this lovely lady in 1965, Liliana, in New York, in Manhattan. Long time ago. That was a long time ago. The first day when I met this lady, we looked each other, you know, strain the eyes. <laughs> yeah. We looked each other, strain the eyes, and I just told her, I was madly in love with her, of course. <laughs> and I told her, you know, you are a fairy tale. You remember that? What did I say? <laughs> <laughs> she told me, yes, but I don't want, it. I don't want you to get too close to me. <laughs> <laughs> I, I am very happy tonight, and I have to thank everybody here, really. But I have to say that after 60 years that I know this lady, She's still a fairy tale, and that's really beautiful. <laughs> thank you, thank you. Thank you. Please give another round of applause to Liliana. Thank you.